Hi, folks, and welcome to the first virtual lunchtime lecture of 2020. We appreciate you being here with us to kick off the season and for being flexible and meeting us online. Um, I do want to introduce our speaker today. His name is Richard, Ricardo Lafour. Um, Ricardo has been a Chicano community activist for over 50 years. Over the years, he's held a number of high profile jobs, most notably the Denver District Director for a former US Senator, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, the Executive Director of the Colorado Migrant Council and Head Start Director for the City of San Francisco, as well as a Family Resource Coordinator in the Denver Public Schools. Ricardo earned a BA in, in business. In 2006, he retired by continuing, but continued to do volunteer work. He is a member of the Chicano Movement Advisory Committee to the History of Colorado Museum. He has been a member of the American GI Forum Mile High Chapter for over 20 years and is writer and director of the Mile High Players, the resident theatrical troupe of the Mile High Chapter. Throughout his career, he has always been able to integrate his deeply held beliefs on justice and equality into whichever job or title was serve he was serving in at the time. He was featured in La Vaz's series, The Best Among Us, was on the urban spectrum list of Hispanics who make a difference, and in 2003 was given the Cesar Chavez Leadership Award. While he has won several awards and accolades by his own admission, his greatest accomplishment has been his 50 years of service to the Chicano, Chicano community. Now I will turn you folks over to Ricardo and we hope you enjoy our lecture. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to ask questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ricardo Lafore. Uh, before I begin, I have to issue a disclaimer that I, I, I must upfront that I'm not here in any official capacity. I am not uh, representing any group or organization and whatever I say uh, must be attributed to me and to me alone. Having said that, it would be impossible to completely describe the Chicano movement in the time that we have allotted today. So for expediency, I'm going to give you an overview, a sort of Chicano 101 and then leave time for some questions. Uh, the history of the Chicano movement is American history and closer to home, a huge part of Colorado history. Its significance and importance cannot be overstated. And yet it is rarely discussed or even remembered. And it deserves to be taught in our schools and it deserves to be in the conversation in the great marketplace of ideas. One organization, uh, History Colorado decided five years ago to partially remedy that and decided to install an exhibit on the Chicano movement in Colorado. They recruited an advisory committee of which I'm part from all over Colorado of uh, activists, community activists and uh, scholars um, to advise on the creation of what would be in that exhibit. Uh, I'm happy to say that the exhibit uh, is now a permanent installation there because originally it was supposed to only run for seven months. And, but given the, the uh, wide applause and, and uh, reception that it got, it is now permanent. And that is something that I'm very proud of. I would recommend a trip to the History of Colorado. Uh, and in addition to the Chicano Movement exhibit, there are wonderful other exhibits there. Uh, all uh, relative to the history of Colorado, one of which is, of course, the Chicano movement. The Chicano movement changed lives for the better. 150 years of systemic discrimination and racism that kept us poor and marginalized, bubbled over and were confronted head on in the decade of the 60s and the 70s and continue to the present day. This is history, living history, Colorado history. I am living proof. I was there. I marched. I picketed. I boycotted. I occupied buildings. I committed acts of civil disobedience because somebody had to do it. And our movement differed from past efforts because instead of asking, we were demanding. This hat and hand business that we'd had before didn't work. So we were much more forceful in our demands. And we did not, if we did not get what we wanted, we were prepared to act. To a great degree, we were emboldened and buoyed in part by the larger civil rights movement. But our demands were not unreasonable. They encompassed a broad section of issues, housing, better jobs, restoration of land grants, farm worker rights, 
enhanced education, political and voting rights. We demanded an end to the Vietnam War. We stood up to police brutality and we demanded only that which we were entitled to by birth. And we were further emboldened by an emerging awareness of our collective history. But at the heart of everything was this self-determination that it be us who would decide our future. As I said, my own personal experiences are interwoven with the history of the movement and my own evolution is part of that history. Those early days were wonderful days, the picket lines, the demonstrations, the sit-ins, the marches. I remember fondly the marches because you met many like-minded people who became forever your friends, who shared your vision and learned and learned from one another. And one lesson which I carry with me to this day is to never, ever underestimate the power of women. When we were on those picket lines, women were not behind or in front of me, but beside me, locked arm in arm, taking the same blows as me. They were warriors, not women warriors, simply warriors. Another adherence is my philosophy of nonviolence as a tactic. Nonviolence works, I've seen it firsthand. That I owe to Cesar Chavez. In the beginning, it was Cesar Chavez and Corky Gonzalez who, for me, uh, pretty much described the movement for me and dictated how we were going to proceed. Those early years were incredibly special. Perhaps the romanticism of it all helped stoke the excitement and the euphoria, but the movement created a vision of what was possible. The world was young, we were young, everything seemed possible, and I was exactly where I needed to be. Those early day highlights include attending the National Chicano Youth Conference at the Crusade for Justice in 69 and meeting Chicanos from all over the US with the same vision that I had. It was a tremendous affirming event. I marched from Pueblo to Denver for farm workers in 70 and met Cesar Chavez in 1975. The Coos boycott of which was initiated by the American GI Forum are but a few of those really truly special events and, and that happened in those early days. I'm living proof that peaceful protest works. I would not be here if I hadn't been part of that wonderful experience. I love history. It allows me to see where we've been, where we are, and ultimately where we're going. Looking back at history allows us to gain insight into today's world and ultimately understand our future. It serves as a window to almost everything. The Chicano movement is history. It happened here in Colorado. I am not a scholar or a historian. What I share with you today comes from the experience of actually being there. History. There's a quote I'm particularly fond of. It is by Hal Borland, a columnist for the New York Times. Borland said, you are rallying your own pride and your own strength, reaching back for some of the fortitude that was the mark of your own people. It is a human impulse and a tribal necessity. And when a man or a people forget where they came from and no longer look back in pride on their beginnings and confidence in their own blood and sinew and beliefs, then that man or that people is doomed. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I believe passionately that people and people of color in particular need to know their history. They must be able to separate myth and legend from the actual history. And they need to know it within the context of American history. And when they do, they will see that they have a vested interest in the welfare of this society and that they played a part in the greatness of our country and they will work to protect it, defend it and improve it. This must happen. Otherwise, they are permanent guests in an unwelcoming house. One of the questions I get a lot is when did the movement actually start? That's very difficult to say. It began at different times for different people. 
the 60s were a decade full of turmoil and change and marches. And the Chicano movement was one of those. For me, it began the day I realized it was time for me to, to join the fight. One could argue that the first Chicano was born the day after the victory of the uh, US over Mexico in the 1946-48 Mexican-American War. Now, I want you to imagine that you are living in Alamosa, Colorado in 1847. You are a Mexican citizen. The following year, the US wins the war and you are a next you are no longer a Mexican citizen. You are an American and you have not moved an inch. That war, which many people believe to be nothing more than a calculated land grab by a rapidly growing country that needed desperately new land to accommodate the westward expansion. But whatever the analysis, in the end result was that for those Mexicans who were living in Mexico one day and the US the next, Certain guarantees were made as per the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Article 8 of that treaty guaranteed that Mexicans who remained more than one year in the seceded lands would be automatically full fledged US citizens. Now, the operative word we're looking for here is full fledged citizens. Well, of course, we know now that that didn't happen. So then in 1848, the uh, long arduous trek towards becoming full-fledged citizens began. As with any oppressed people, certain moves were made to fight back along the way. Some people rose up to challenge the status quo. In 1929, the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC sprung up to challenge the discrimination that was so prevalent in those days. LULAC wanted to work with a, within the system. They, their big concern was education and well, it should be. So LULAC was able to make some changes, get some attention and uh, they sat back and, and did what they could and waited patiently for progress and full citizenship to begin. World War II was supposed to change everything. We rationalized that if we went to war, spilled our blood in defense of democracy, things would change when we got back. Of course, now we know that didn't happen either. When we were serving and dying, we were Americans, but when we returned, we reverted to being Mexican. In 1948, a young medical doctor by the name of Hector P. Garcia, who had served in the war and was practicing in Corpus Christi, Texas, began hearing scores about scores of Mexican American soldiers having difficulty getting health care at the VA or getting their health benefits. And he formed the first meeting of what was to become the American GI Forum. The American GI Forum might have just continued to be a South Texas group. Uh, advocating in, in the southern part of that state. But uh, in 1949, a uh, soldier who had died in World War II by the name of Felix Longoria had his remains returned for burial at the cemetery in Three Rivers, Texas. But the good folks at the Three Rivers uh, Cemetery in Texas decided that they wouldn't allow Longoria to be buried there. They had a special section of the cemetery for Mexican Americans. And uh, his, his, in effect, his rationale, the funeral home director's rationale was that the white folks wouldn't like it if they buried a Mexican there. So says uh, um, Hector Garcia contacted then newly elected US Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson and asked for his help to intervene. I have a copy of a telegram where Johnson wrote back to Garcia and said, I cannot force the people of Texas to do, to do that, but what I can do is arrange for Mr. Longoria to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery. And so that happened. And the uh, 
the attending publicity, uh, the New York Times ran an article while I think Walter Winchell opened his, his program that night with the Longoria story. And uh, so the Longoria affair really catapulted the, uh, the uh, GI Forum and subsequently Mexican-American soldiers into the national spot. So we're grateful for that. Those were the things that, that were done before the modern Chicano movement. But, but we're grateful for those precursors to the, uh, to the uh, precursors to the movement. The movement was the recipient of everything that came before it. LULAC and the GI Forum kept the idea of protest, protest as a means uh, to an end in the quiet incubating years. And secondly, it was from these groups that the future sprang and from which future generations found the inspiration to continue the struggle until the movement, the Chicano movement, uh, changed everything. I'm asked a lot by the young people of today, whenever I do these talks in public schools or at the, at the museum. And I have to give a shout out to the youth of today. I'm extremely optimistic about them. They seem to me in my conversations with them to be much more respective of all cultures, of all orientations. Uh, they value all, all, orientations, the LGBTQ community, which comes under constant attack, uh, they are the first generation to openly embrace everyone. And despite progress in other areas, today we remain sharply divided along racial lines. And that's sad, that saddens me. But racism has been with us a long time. I don't know how we can stop it. But I know this, racism is taught. That behavior is learned. And when we stop teaching it, perhaps new generations will stop learning it. Today's youth have inherited a mess and they're dealing with it. The issues are different, but just as important. As I said, racism remains and that's tragic. We have issues now with the, the DACA students and the dreamers. And we must deal with the issue of immigration and, uh, and, and, and create a path to citizenship, global warming, climate change. We should listen to those young people and value their ideas. We can never run out of, of new ideas. And another question I get from a lot of young people in general and Chicano youth in particular is, how can I get involved? My advice, to the young people of today as they inherit this planet is, think for yourselves. Do not be afraid to, get, to go against the tide of public opinion. People often hesitate to say things they believe because others will not agree with them. Well, that may be easier, but the road not taken is full of wonder and surprise. I would urge them to serve the people. There's nothing more noble and there is a great deal of satisfaction and knowing that you're giving back to those who came before you. That first impulse, if it's from the heart, is probably the correct one. You don't need a focus group to tell you what to do. You already know what to do. I always take the opportunity to serve. The people are your focus group. Do not be a slave to political parties, but definitely be a slave to your principles. Compromise on tactics, but never on principle. Principles are your core beliefs, that which you hold so dear and near that you would never even think of betraying them. To the Latino youth out there, know your history and never ever let anyone tell you that you're not American enough. You want proof? A total of 60 Latinos have earned the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest military honor we can bestow on anyone. We have fought and bled and died in every one of this country's wars and conflicts. Know that so that when you're asked, you can tell them. 
most of you will be able to vote in the next presidential presidential election. So go out and let the next slate of candidates know what you want, and then organize and vote for the one that reflects your vision and passion for America. It's up to you. My time has passed. Our time has passed. Finally, speak out in anger, but never in hatred. Hatred is the great deceiver. It clouds your vision and makes it difficult to do the right thing. Remember, you're just as good as anyone. Not better, but just as good. You have a wonderful culture and a heritage to be proud of, and you should share it with the rest of the world as I do. Oh, and by the way, while you're doing that, have fun. Don't grow up too fast. There has been much, much project, uh, progress, as I said. Uh, the first 10 years of my movement experience from 69 to 79 were for me the most meaningful. They provided the foundation of what was to come and gave us a glimpse of what was possible. I remember those days as happy days, full of wonder, adventure, and a spiritual awakening. Everything up until then lacked cohesion and purpose. And from the moment I made my commitment to the movement, everything changed. The world changed. Suddenly, the world and all of its wonders became abundantly clear. Things that were a mystery were suddenly revealed to me. Things I took for granted took on new meaning. The world was young and everything was possible. Those metaphysical yet worldly feelings carried me on their shoulders and showed me the way. The movement provided the rest. Finally, let me say this, and I really mean this. At the risk of sounding melodramatic, the movement saved my life. Before the movement, I was lost. I was struggling for an identity, looking for ways to fight back. I've always been a clever, articulate, resourceful guy, but my enthusiasm and energy were being wasted. I have spent the greater portion of my adult life in that pursuit and I have never regretted one moment. My service to the Chicano community has been one of the great joys of my life. I've had faults, I've had victories, I've had defeats. But each one of them has been a, a lesson, a learning experience from which I molded yet another way to serve. There is a great deal of personal reward in working for the people. As I look back now, there are, there are uh, moments that stand out and burn brightly in my mind. The march from Pueblo to Denver, tired, hot, dusty, but smiling inwardly, knowing that I was exactly where I belonged, doing exactly what I needed to do. The intoxicating chance of huelga as we marched the Chicano Youth Conference in Denver and many, many, many moments, uh, too numerous to mention all. But in each of those moments, I sensed the feeling that we were doing his will and that one day our efforts would result in a just and better society. Lastly, the movement provided me a forum on which to share with the rest of humanity the unique experiences of being Chicano, something I continue to do in the present day. It's like a, a burning fire in my heart and like my mind and soul that I was born with, it shall be with me all of my days. Let me stop there and, and see if there are any uh, questions that uh, the audience may have. Well, Ricardo, we do just wanna say thank you first and foremost. Uh, the Historic Park does have a few questions um, and then we're hoping other people would love to ask you too. Um, so we were just wondering, how can you expand a little bit on how things have changed? Um, what is, I mean, what is life like? Yeah, well, yeah. 
there's there's been a lot of progress. Clearly, there's been a lot of progress, um, but not enough to suit me. I, we 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 we've still got a long way to go. In in baseball jargon, you might you could say we're we're rounding second and headed for third, but we still got to get home. Uh, back then, just just getting a college degree, uh, earning a bachelor's degree was a monumental achievement. But the student activists made sure that 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 we that was one of the the big goals that we had, and so many many of us. Uh, got our degrees some of them some of us even got our masters and ultimately their their uh, phds but now we have to be poised to take the next step and as we ponder the future it's become crystal clear to me that we must create the leadership core that will address the true educational needs of our children and future generations it's this it's no longer uh, enough to just get a bachelor's degree it's no longer enough to just get by and survive. We have to have the will and the courage to overcome and excel. Uh, racism, of course, is still with us. I don't know how we can fix that. Uh, no, no child is born thinking that people of color are inferior. They're taught that. So uh, be careful what you say because the children are listening. We have in, 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 the, in the years since then, we've been able to elect a Chicano mayor, Federico Pena, uh, twice uh, for the city of Denver, followed by a black mayor, Wellington Webb. We've had a Chicano senator, Ken Salazar, who later became secretary of the interior. His younger brother, John, was elected to Congress. The Colorado legislator, legislator, legislature has had two Hispanic speakers of the house, Ruben Valdez and Chris Santa Duran. So we've done a lot, but there's still a lot to do. Uh, uh, immigration reform is, is clearly one of the top, one of the top uh, priority items for me. We, we, have, to, we have to deal with that. Uh, hopefully from some of the stuff that we're seeing, something good will come out of that. Uh, but yes, there's been a lot of progress, but we've still got a long way to go. Uh, I recall the words of my mother when she was, towards the end, she looked up at me from her bed and said, we've come so far and yet we have so far to go. I wasn't sure what she was talking about then, but I know what she was talking about now. Um, the, the 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 hopes and dreams are going to be passed on to the to the next generation. I'm not going to be around long enough to see it. I I, I can only envision a, a future without without racism, um, without hatred. Uh, but <clears throat> one thing that I I uh, I, I know is that <clears throat> so many so many things that seemed uh, impossible at the time not only were possible but came to fruition uh, one of the things that has changed and there's nothing that we could have done about that is is the use of social media in 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 creating uh, movements or sustaining movements i i used to joke around uh, that uh, uh, when I wanted to contact a thousand of my Chicano compatriots that I needed a thousand quarters. I, ne I needed to be able to be by a phone booth and make a thousand phone calls. Now that can be done with a push of a button if you have a, a distribution list that that's big. So that's, and so social media has, has been able to, to do a lot of good things. It has been able to rally people in numbers uh, unprecedented that maybe, uh, uh, 30, 50 years ago, uh, we didn't think possible. Uh, but I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm optimistic. There's, we've we've come a long way, but there's still a, a, a lot, a lot to do. Uh, there are so many, so many uh, issues that uh, that are out there. Some are small, some are large, but all of them are important. So let's. Uh, I I would say that uh, the 
one of the biggest differences now is is uh, the the awareness that we created back then resulted in a lot of change. But any gains that you make, gains that you make, uh, must be codified into law. Otherwise, people can come along and take those rights away from you. That's why civil rights are so important. There are rights that you they are not guaranteed to you in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights. There are rights that you fought for and, and made come to fruition, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act, and so forth. And uh, so, as I said, I'm optimistic. And uh, I don't know how much longer I have on this earth, but it would make every defeat, every disappointment, every cut, injury, and insult and fall to see a Latino or a Latina take the oath of office and enter that White House door. And when that happens, I will gladly look upward and say, I'm finished. I'm coming home. I hope that answers your question. Indeed it does. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, additionally, we just want to hear a little bit more about what it is you're doing now. Um, please tell us some more about your historic history. Ugh. History, Colorado position, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, the, the initial welcoming uh, reception took, took place in uh, 2000, 2015, uh, April. It was, a, it was a wonderful event uh, coming together to, to unveil the, the exhibit. And uh, at that reception were a lot of people uh, school teachers and, and, and school executives who uh, later on started signing up groups, classrooms to come to view the exhibit. And uh, it was decided that it would be nice to have a, uh, a docent or a uh, uh, tour guide to describe and to, and to talk about the exhibits as a uh, as, we, as they were taking the tour. And later we began to get a lot of calls from schools and could someone come to the classroom and talk about the Chicano movement because uh, so many of the students in, in, uh, in Denver and in, in the surrounding areas, classrooms were Latino. Uh, so I volunteered to do that I, and uh, since, since that day, uh, I, I can't, uh, countless times that I've gone to schools, high schools, colleges uh, in the in greater metro, metropolitan area. And uh, I have hosted countless other groups that, that made the trek to the museum to, to view the, the actual exhibit. And there has been a, a great resurgence in, uh, in uh, an interest in the Chicano movement because of that. I think History Colorado deserves a lot of credit for that because, uh, uh, it, and I thank them for recruiting me to be on the exhibit. And also on the exhibit, I got to, uh, at those meetings, I got to see a lot of old friends who were there marching, protesting, taking part in, in those movement activities back then and there. And some new people who were very, very, Maybe they weren't around during the heyday of the Chicano movement, but who, who uh, were very, very interested in, in following up. So that, that uh, remains, I, I hope that uh, whoever is viewing or whoever is listening out there will take the time to, to go out and visit the actual exhibit at History Colorado. Uh, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, and some teachers were so so pleased with the exhibit that they would send me notes or emails later and saying the kids couldn't stop talking about it on the way home. Some kids have decided to do little little projects of their own and would I come out and talk to them and maybe uh, uh, judge a contest or judge a, a poster contest. It's been an altogether wonderful experience for me, particularly for me, an old guy like me. I mean, you know, I. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 70s now. I, 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 uh, I, I marched from Pueblo to, to, 
to Denver once, but I probably couldn't march a mile now, you know, but what I can do, what I'm still able to do is speak. And, uh, and so that's, that's, that's what I do. And it, it's a, it's a real joy to be able to do that. And I really enjoy doing that. I, I love seeing the faces of those young people, particularly when they raise their hand and want to know, what can I do? What can I do to make this world a better place? And, and so it, it creates not only an opportunity to teach, but an opportunity for me to continue learning, because I don't think you ever stop learning. Well, Ricardo, that's actually a perfect segue. We did have a question pop up on Facebook. A gentleman named Tim uh, says, when, and if you have the chance, do you have any for any advice for first time activists and organizers looking to address social issues in their communities? He also extends his thanks. Uh, well, you know, like I said earlier, uh, I don't know if the young man or young person was on when I, uh, in, 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 I think probably the, the best advice is this, is that it, when you get the urge or, you, or, or you're suddenly struck with the idea that you want to, that you want to uh, do something, you know, is to examine both sides of the issue. Make sure that what you're doing is truly addressing the issue. Do not let uh, other people detract you from what, what you believe. And when you're not sure, you know, if, if, if the avenue of approach or is, doesn't, doesn't pop up in your head, look to your heart. I think if it feels right, it's probably right. As I said before, that first impulse is, is, is probably the correct one if it's from your heart. You know right from wrong. It, it, you don't need a focus group to tell you what to do. You already have it within you, within the goodness of your heart. If you want to truly do something to help out, that tells me that there must be something inside of you that is good and that is, and that is looking to, to, to uh, uh, promote peace and justice in this society. Go with your heart. I mean, your heart cannot, it, it, will, it will never let you down. If, if, if it feels right, it's more than less right. And, and again, like I said, compromise on tactics, but never abandon your principles, you know. Uh, the principles are basically your guiding light. They'll tell you what to do. If, if something seems wrong to you, then, and then you, that, that, that's probably wrong. And uh, that may not be true in every instance, but as a, as a general rule or as a guiding principle for me, if it felt right in my heart, it was probably the right thing to do. Uh, 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 again, like I said, speak out in anger, but never in hatred, because hatred diminishes an entire nation, and and uh, it makes it hard uh, for you to do the right thing when when you're motivated by hatred, uh, and 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 uh, uh, it makes it difficult to do the right thing if if your if your uh, motives are not are not pure yeah, pure of heart. So. I, uh, uh, that, that sounds a little preachy, but I, uh, that's, that's what I believe. And uh, I, it has served me well. I know that in, <clears throat> in my lifetime, I've been confronted with, with uh, situations where I wanted to fight back physically because it felt like the right thing to do. But in the end, I opted for the nonviolent approach and the nonviolent approach was turned out to be the correct one. Uh, an eye for an eye, as Gandhi once said, makes everybody blind. So uh, act out of, out of compassion and, and out of uh, sincere change and not out of revenge or vengeance. Excellent. Well, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. It has been an absolute joy. And I'm sure everybody who's listening um, walks away inspired and, and looks for better opportunities in their community to make a difference. Uh, so there's, there's yeah. nobody I could have better, uh, better have to kick off our lecture series. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you I want to, I want to say goodbye to everybody, especially to the people of, um, Frisco, because originally I was supposed to go out to the museum and speak, uh, but because of our current 
pandemic, we're not able to do that. So I look forward to and sometime in the near future when this is all over that I can actually go to Prisco and meet and talk and see the faces of the people that I'm talking with. Uh, until then, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, goodbye. Uh, be safe and uh, be well. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, that concludes our first lecture. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, if you have any other questions, comments, please um, shoot us an email on Facebook or to museum at townoffrisco.com. Uh, just to remind you, we are going to be back later this month with additional virtual lectures. You can keep an eye on our Facebook and our website. We, all, we also will be posting the videos to our YouTube page. So keep in contact, uh, but we will see you in a couple weeks with Jacob K and some fun facts about animals. But with that, we're signing off.